Welcome everyone to the final week, week six. You made it. This week we'll be talking about digital advertising and we'll explore some of the channels and tools used to reach customers around the world. So why would we consider digital marketing over traditional channels? Well, there are lots of reasons why advertisers have migrated to digital channels. And here are some of the key reasons. Traditional media channels such as TV, radio, and newsprint tend to be costly and take a mass marketing approach to addressing a body, uh, buyer audience, which is akin to a one-size-fits-all approach. They're also typically challenging to measure. This makes determining the success of your campaigns pretty difficult. On the other hand, digital media channels leverage the internet and its detailed tracking, targeting, and measurement capabilities. They're incredibly flexible and adaptive and allow you to craft very specific and targeted campaigns. Because they're more focused, you can run campaigns of almost any size and budget, and that means they're much more affordable and effective. Search engine marketing refers to the marketing of paid digital advertising aimed at drawing traffic to landing pages of your website. The ads themselves get displayed on a search engine results page, a SERP, S-E-R-P. On a SERP, you can generally pick out paid search results in one of two ways. First, they're typically the first several and last several search results on a SERP. And the dead giveaway is the word ad before the website link in the search result itself. So when it comes to search engine marketing, we're basically talking about Google and to a lesser degree, Microsoft Bing. Google ads have a great click-through rate. Paid ads on Google get 65% of the clicks. 43% of customers buy something they've seen on a YouTube ad and Google ads help you create a high ROI marketing campaign. So how do Google ads work? Well, they display your ad to potential leads or customers who are interested in your product or service. And they allow advertisers to pay per click or pay per impression when the ads are served to people searching on Google. As an advertiser, you bid on search terms or keywords and the winners of those bids are placed at the top of search results pages or on YouTube videos or on relevant websites, depending on the type of ad campaign you've selected. Many factors impact your ability to create effective and high-performing Google ads. And we're gonna cover a few of these here. In addition to your bid amount, your Google quality score determines where your ad will rank in your search results. Now, Google wants your ads to be successful, so they provide this score as an estimate of the quality of the combination of your ads, your keywords, and your landing pages. The higher the quality, the lower the price, and the better overall positioning of your ad. So a bit of research in this area is important because your keywords need to match a searcher's intent as closely as possible. That's because Google displays your ad by matching it with search queries based on the keywords you've selected. When you first set up your Google ad, you'll set the geographical area in which you want to target your customers, and only customers in those target areas will see your ad. Finally, this is once again where your buyer personas come back into play because you also want to set parameters such as demographics and interests. Now your ad copy needs to stand out over your, uh, your competitors' ads. It needs to match the searcher's intent, align with your target keywords, and provide potential customers with the answer or solution to their query. In the example on screen, a search for handcrafted jewelry yielded this result in the list. The copy is concise and uses the, li uh, the limited space to convey their message. Note that the keyword handcrafted is also in the headline to indicate a good keyword match. The description addresses the query of the persona, treat yourself or your loved ones to a piece of wearable art. This ad directs the user to collections in their online store.
Ad extensions are a Google Ads feature that show extra business information such as a promotion or an offer, your business's location, or a phone number, or click to call if the results are on a mobile device. These offer your prospects additional information and another option for responding and interacting with your ad. Here's an example of how these extensions are exposed on a desktop results page versus a mobile results page. I should note that extensions aren't guaranteed to appear. Google search results will display your extensions when Google's algorithms decide if those extensions are predicted to improve your overall ads performance or if your ad ranking score is high enough for those extensions to show. There's no extra cost for these extensions, even if they're clicked on. So once you've gone through all of the steps in setting up your Google ad campaigns, here are a few other tips to ensure your ads are optimally set up and are easily trackable. First off, you'll want to have Google Analytics tracking set up on your website for monitoring visitor traffic, monitoring conversions, and other metrics. And then you should link your analytics account to your Google Ads campaign. This can complete the picture of user behavior by consolidating your information into one place, a single dashboard. It can provide you with additional information to help you optimize your AdWords campaigns, and it provides more options and tools for remarketing and retargeting, as we've talked about in previous sessions. You also want to use conversion tracking to tell you the number of customers or leads that you've acquired from your ad campaigns. Conversion tracking allows you to track website sales, app installations or calls from your ads, or what other metrics you want to track. You do this by creating a conversion action in your Google Ads account, and then Google tells, uh, gives you a conversion tracking tag, then you add to your website. The tag then tracks when someone's clicked on your ad and goes to your website and then completes an action that you've defined, such as a purchase. Finally, if you're using CRM tools to track contact data, some of them support integration with Google Ads and Google Analytics. This gives you the ability to track which ad campaigns are working for your audience so you can continue marketing to those clients with relevant offers. As I've mentioned, Google Ads is primarily based around bidding on keywords. Once you're ready to start running your ads, you'll need to establish a bidding strategy. There are two options for bidding on keywords, automated and manual. In automated bidding, Google automatically adjusts your bids based on your competitors. After defining your maximum budget, Google will try to give you the best chance at winning uh, your bid within the parameters that you've defined. In manual bidding, you set your bid amounts for your ad groups and your keywords, so you have control to do things like reducing your ad spends on lower performing ads. With Google Ads, you can select from one of three campaign types, search, display, or video. Search ads are basically triggered from a search query by users looking for related products or services. Display ads appear to potential customers who visit pages related to your ad's topic of interest. And video ads are essentially the ads you see on YouTube and can be tar uh, targeted to specific viewers. Google's basic search ads are the text ads that get displayed on Google's SERPs. The benefit of search ads is that you're displaying your ad to people who are essentially searching for your product or service on Google Search. Google now shows your ad in the exact same format as organic results, with the exception of the discrete placement of the word ad, so users are more likely to click on it. Google's responsive search ads allow you to enter multiple versions of headlines and ad copy. Originally, there was only one static version of your ad, using the, said, uh, the same headline and description each time. Each version of your responsive ad is then tested until Google determines which version gets the most clicks and is therefore best suited to your target audience. We've talked a little bit about Google Display Network. 
um, in previous sessions, including last week when we were covering retargeting. The Google Display Network is a network of websites in various industries who have opted in to display Google Ads on their pages. Businesses join this network because they're paid for clicks or impressions on the ads. This is great for advertisers because they can get their content in front of audiences that are aligned with their target personas. Display ads are commonly seen on partner sites like news sites and blogs, and the ads typically take the form of a static image. With video ads, the most common form of video-based advertising is YouTube. YouTube is owned by Google, and it features its own Google-powered video search. Paid video ads are displayed before or after shorter YouTube videos or at key points during longer uh, YouTube videos. YouTube ads also make use of keywords that can trigger your ad to relevant audiences and hopefully grab their attention. Since we've already covered social media ad placements in a previous session, I'm not going to dive, uh, dive too deep into specifics of placing ads on each social platform. Instead, let's take a look at some of the differences between paid search and social media advertising, looking at Google and Facebook, the two big ones. Now, there are a lot of similarities between both advertising platforms in that you can target your ads to defined customer segments. But when we look at Google Ads, however, it's based primarily on paid search and keyword strategies. Because it's mostly based on search criteria, that is, audiences are actively searching for something specific, Google ad strategies are often considered active and most frequently focused on conversions. Now, when we consider Facebook ads, it falls into an advertising category commonly referred to as paid social. It's considered a passive advertising channel because individuals aren't specifically looking for a product or a service. While it does include some keyword targeting options, its strengths lie more in generating awareness and introducing your brand to new prospects. Facebook also offers more granular, uh, granular targeting options based on things like demographics, interest, relationship status, life events, politics, and many more. They both offer campaign development tools need, uh, and lead nurturing tools through retargeting and detailed analytics. I've often heard the difference described between the two as Google helps new customers find your brand, where Facebook helps your, uh, your brand find new customers. Now I'm going to speak a little bit about key considerations for your social advertising plan. I've broken them down into the five basic steps. The first step shown here is setting your advertising goals. Before starting any campaign, you'll want to ask yourself, is the objective to drive conversions, such as direct sales, seek engagement, such as likes or shares, build connections, including followers and subscribers, or is it to raise awareness of your products and your brand? In week one of our series, we discussed the concept of buyer personas, and the assignment was to develop those personas for your business. When creating our buyer personas, we need to consider customer demographics, behavioral patterns, motivations, questions, challenges, goals, etc. The more detail you can provide, the better. Personas have been referenced multiple times throughout this series. When developing your digital ad campaign, these personas play a critical role when both developing your messages and refining the advertising targets for your messages. We take everything we've established from defining our personas and tailor our messages to accommodate the personas, identifiers, goals, and challenges. We may map different messages for each persona, depending on your audiences and the media that best impacts their purchasing decisions. Last week, we talked about CRM and we examined the customer or buyer journey also called a sales pipeline or sales funnel. When developing your ad campaign, you need to consider which stage you're focusing on. 
Please note that the actual customer journey for your business may differ from what I'm presenting here. The stage in the customer journey will play a big part in the actual contents of your ad messages, since you'll want to match your content to each stage of that customer's journey. It's important to make sure that your ads deliver a clear, simple message that speaks to your target wherever they are in that buyer journey. In our week covering content, we covered some key considerations when designing and laying out your advertising message. These include the use of color, the use of motion, if allowable, and quality photography. In our most recent session about CRM, we also talked about how to craft our marketing messages using marketing psychology tactics to persuade your, pros uh, your prospects to take note. These tactics include the concept of reciprocity, social proof, scarcity, foot in the door, and framing. Finally, we'll need to move that prospect to action, to click through and to continue their journey, which is why a call to action is so important. When someone clicks on your call to action, you need to make sure that where they're going is the next proper step in their journey. To start, your landing page needs to deliver exactly what your ad promised. For instance, if your ad is for a specific product, then make sure that link goes to the products page, or it links to your blog or your newsletter, your sign up form, and so on. Once you've got your core campaign elements planned out, this includes things like your ads, your landing pages, and so forth, you'll want to deploy your campaign on a target channel. Now, as we've uh, covered over the last couple of weeks, each channel has its own workflow for setting up campaigns and deploying ads. They're all fairly well documented, so I'm not going to cover each channel step by step. They're also prone to revisions and changes, so I don't want to lock any specific process into our sessions since they can get quickly dated. That being said, however, from a high level, they all follow a fairly straightforward sequence of steps. So I'm using Facebook as an example here. As a first step, you'd set up and create your campaign. Then you define your objective. Do you want to increase traffic, leads, conversions, etc.? That would be then followed by defining your audience. That is, defining their interests, their demographics, their motivations, their questions, etc. Then you set your budget. Then you upload and format your ad. That is, uh, is it an image, a video, a carousel ad, products, and so forth. Then you write your ad post description and your call to action. So last week we talked about nurturing your leads through remarketing and we explored the Facebook pixel, which is a snippet of analytics code that you place on your website. This little piece of code does more than just assist with remarketing. It collects data that helps you track conversions from your ads, which tells you whether or not your ads are working. It helps you optimize your ads. It helps you be, uh, build targeted audiences for future ads. And it helps you remarket to people who have already taken some kind of action on your website. Facebook can also use its retargeting data for building what's referred to as a lookalike audience, which is an audience of people who have similar interests and demographics to people that have already interacted with your website. This can help you grow your potential customer base. With pixel tracking data, you can also optimize, optimize for which events on your website are getting the best conversions, such as clicks, online signups, enrollments, and purchases, whichever event conversions align best with your business. Last week, we also talked about the Google Ads tag, which is Google code, which is Google's version of a code snippet that helps with overall site measurement, tracking your conversions, and your remarketing campaigns. All-in-one hosted solutions like Squarespace, Wix, and Shopify provide tools for you to incorporate both your Facebook pixel and your Google Ads tag. Here's our first digital advertising case study. 
The NASCAD Community Studio Residency Program offers visual artists and qualified craftspeople the opportunity to develop their practice through donated studio space in a residency site within Nova Scotia. The Cape Breton Center for Craft and Design is actually a NASCAD partner under this program. The organization needed help attracting emerging, uh, emerging Canadian artists and bringing national attention to their artists in residence program with the goal of attracting and enrolling new applicants to the program. With the help of a digital agency, NASCAD developed a strategy to, do, uh, to identify and reach potential candidates for the artists in residence program. The specific nature of the program required very precise targeting. Their campaign used banners and videos in Facebook and Instagram so they could pinpoint artists from across Canada. The campaign was a big success, seeing, seeing nearly 4,000 applicants being submitted, with 94% of those applications being directly attributed to the campaign. The RADs experienced a 6% engagement rate. That's compared to an industry average of about 0.17%. Our second case study is Ted Collier. Ted is an American contemporary artist and painter best known for his abstract works, reducing his environments to their essential forms and colors. His career as an artist began in St. Louis, Missouri in 2008 after the financial crash, leaving behind a 15-year career in real estate and construction. We've selected Ted as a case study because he has an incredibly well-executed SEO strategy. If you recall, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization and helps with your search page results. You can test this out for yourself by simply doing a Google search for Ted Collier Artist. He's featured in every link in the first Google search results page. His website is concise and its contents have been carefully crafted to maximize SEO. It's also clear that he's worked really hard to maintain his, uh, his social profiles and his affiliations with other sites, including artist registries, news groups, news media, and galleries. Much of his artwork is very ad friendly and lends itself nicely to placements since much of his style is based around essential forms and colors. Our final case study here is Rubinsky Works. They're owned by artist, photographer, and designer Madison Holler. We've included this case study because it's a good example of how an artist has successfully separated two distinct lines of products and services, beadwork and wedding photography and videography. So these are presented as two different sections on our website. Her site doesn't feature a lot of text and what is there has been carefully crafted to maximize aligning with online search. She's very active on Instagram and Facebook and it appears that most of her advertising acti uh, activity takes place on Instagram. Her site and storefront have been built using Squarespace. So before I hand off to our guest panelist, I want to mention a few final tips to help you make the best use of your time when you're deploying your digital ads. First, keep your ear to the ground and monitor the levels of engagement you're getting. This is going to be different for everyone. What works on Facebook, Instagram, or Google for one artist might not work for another and vice versa. Carefully review and prepare your content. It's important to tag all of your photos and ensure that your content aligns with what you can see people are looking for. Make sure your content is relevant and on point. And depending on your products and services, you may need to be even more selective, as in the case of fine art, where the rule of less is more applies even more substantially. When you're crafting your messages, make sure to think about who you want to target and at what stage they're at in your sales funnel. And finally, make sure that your landing pages are a continuation of the shopping experience. That is, that you're delivering on the promise that you're making to your, uh, your prospect in those ads. So here's a quick recap of what we covered during today's session. We define the various types of advertising approaches in search engine marketing, including search, display, and video ads. We took a more detailed look at Google ads and why they're so useful for advertisers. We examined social media marketing, what it is, and how to plan for it. We then took a closer look at Facebook ads, its various formats, how they're set up, 
and how they're used to attract customers. We examine the importance of analyzing your campaigns. And finally, we reviewed several case studies of artists and organizations who are successfully using paid digital advertising and social media. So for this week's assignment and, and the last assignment, we'd like you to either set up a Google Ads account or a Facebook Ads account, then design and deploy your first ad and monitor the results. So that wraps up this session and the series. We hope it was helpful and we, and we wish you the best of luck as you expand your business into the digital space. Thanks so much for participating and for your attention.